last week, uh, we saw Jesus uh, take on the religious, cultural, and political elite of Israel. The, those that were in charge of the temple were also in charge of taxation, in charge of the Jewish military. Uh, these were, these, if you were an important person, you wanted to be close to the temple elite. So it was not only religious elite, but cultural elite, uh, where the popular rich kids hung out, and the political elite of Israel. And Jesus, this wandering preacher who said, I don't even have a, a place to lay my head. Uh, he's not done yet. <laughs> Jesus, uh, not only was he not politically correct, uh, he wasn't uh, a guy who held back from speaking truth to power. In sometimes, uh, I know this is a surprise to everybody. Everybody thinks that Dan likes to preach the very difficult, hard-hitting messages. But sometimes I really uh, am envious of preaching those nice, easy messages that everybody likes you when you preach them. And some Sometimes I wonder if the guys that are on television, they keep preaching that kind of sermon, it's because they're not going through the Bible step by step the way we are. And the Bible just doesn't lend it. I mean, each week I keep hoping for one of those. And the Bible, God apparently didn't write the Bible that way. And Jesus didn't write it. He wasn't here just to win popularity contests and say nice, easy things that make him popular uh, and, and well-liked. So... So those are the kinds of messages I, I like to preach, and God is just not cooperating. And, uh, but like we always do, uh, it's in the Bible, we, we teach it, even, uh, even the scary stuff. You know, uh, this is a total aside, but uh, Brother John Cook saw the Moses, not the Moses movie, the Noah movie. What was your comment? Eh. And uh, I haven't seen it yet, but uh, it, it strikes me on the positive side about that film is sometimes we reduce the story of Noah to a smiling old man on a boat with a bunch of smiling giraffes and, and elephants and things. And God, in his sovereignty, had just ordained to wipe out the vast majority of the human race. And uh, we, but we make it cutesy, we make it a kid's story. And it's so amazing to me that this huge moment in the history of the human race and in the history of God's work, not only is the world misunderstanding, but we Christians are working hard to take the scary edges off of it. When God himself said, no, I'm a God of justice, I will bring wrath down on humanity, you have to get right with me. The Bible says that Moses, or no preacher of righteousness, he was preaching righteousness, turn to God, turn to God. And yet at the end of his ministry, all he had was his own family. And uh, we, we don't want to be a church or as individual Christians, as much as I'd like to make everything easy, uh, in, in, uh, we don't want to be always taking the edges off of what God's doing. Otherwise, what are we doing? We're working against God, right? This, uh, this work of God in history is scary, and it's probably supposed to be scary. And uh, I'm not saying you can't have the little cute arc toys where you put all the animals in. There's nothing wrong with that. But if as, if as adults we're still stuck there, that's an issue. And so uh, week after week, we're going slowly through the Bible so we can just take it at face value and God, who does he think he is? He's, he thinks he's God, and he thinks that he has the right to judge, and he will judge. And we better get right with the sovereign of the universe, otherwise we end up on the wrong side of the equation. So Jesus is dealing with these leaders, this political elite. They'd be kind of like a mix between Washington, D.C. and Hollywood, right? And maybe, maybe Silicon Valley because of the money, but <coughs> he's dealing harshly with these people. He's not fawning over them because of their p position. But he's not dealing harshly with them because he hates them. And that's kind of, <coughs> that's kind of a <coughs> an easy thing for us to fall into a trap where, oh, those religious people, they're so self-righteous, blah, 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 blah. And, and then we end up elevating ourselves because we're able to put them down, which hardly is uh, the message God wants us to get out of it. But Jesus was not hating these people. One, he was exposing their evil to the people, <coughs> the populace, 
so that they won't follow these guys. The blind should not lead the blind. These men were caught up in uh, worldly power structures, and, and they were not the people who should be leading God's people. And secondly, he was trying to break through their self-assurance. And self-assurance is a big one for us in the United States today. We're, we're self-made people. We're self-reliant. We, we, uh, we like to glorify that. And, and, you know, it's one of those things where a strength can be used by God to become a weakness. And <coughs> you're going to have to put up with a lot of coughing today. Uh, uh, we'll see. They're very set in their ways, and their ways are wrong. Very set in their ways, their ways are wrong. And, and so God's not holding any punches back. So he's, one, he's trying to expose these leaders to be the religious frauds that they are so that people won't follow them. <coughs> <coughs> and secondly, breaking through their self-assurance because the only chance they have to fall on their knees in front of holy God is to realize they ain't. I still got a cough drop, but thank you, honey. I'll take a hug, too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So today, Jesus is going to tell him another story, and it has uh, several elements. He's, he's using these stories to illustrate. One is there's this, there's this landowner. He owns a, a vineyard. And you, know, you often hear about... Uh, the people of God being a flock and God is the chief shepherd. Well, here uh, there's a landowner who owns this vineyard and, and the landowner is, is going to be God in this story. Uh, the land itself, the vineyard itself, is going to be God's people. The, 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 the wine of the land is, is God's people. The tenants are, he leases the land to some people. He entrusts them to take care of God's people, to take care of the, the grapes, to produce the wine, and these are the religious leaders. These are the people who are running the temple at that time. Remember, we talked about how all the Jewish people and the God-fearing Gentiles would be coming to Jerusalem to hear from these people, and they were themselves spiritually bankrupt. Remember the, the picture of the fig tree. You go to the fig tree because you're hungry, and Jesus said, no longer will people go to you. It's, he cursed it, and people were going to Jerusalem. God says, okay, that's gonna, that t time of history is coming to an end. The, then he talks about the landowner sends his servants back to the property because the tenants are, are taking care of it for him, and they're supposed to give him, uh, I guess the standard fee at that time would be at least 25% of the proceeds. So the idea is God sending his servants back <coughs> uh, to collect the profits. In this case, uh, he's collecting true people of faith from the tenants. The, the servants are the prophets and the priests who still remain faithful to God. They were really love of God, trying to live a, a, a true life faith. They weren't just in it because it was cultural to be religious. And so these folks are going back and they want to see fruit. Where's the harvest? And uh, in the story, the tenants tried to, to beat those guys up or kill them, which was true in human history. When God would send a prophet, they were, they were usually disliked, to say the least. Uh, sometimes beaten, sometimes killed. So God, in his story, the landowner eventually sends his son. His son is unique. He's just not one of the other servants. And, and this is Jesus talking about himself. And then, then he takes the land away from the old guys who are running it, and he says, I'm going to new tenants to care for God's people. And this is Jesus prophesying the forecoming of the church. We're going to have a new structure that's going to uh, ordain to, to care for God's people, the, the vineyard, the sheep. The, uh, God uses those, both those kind of metaphors. And uh, we talked about last week how if God was uh, willing to remove uh, the temple in, the, in the, the, that power system because of unfaithfulness, that we should not think, no, it's the church, we're all fine. No, if, we're, if we become unfaithful, then we cease to be a church and we're, we're removed from God's plans as well. There's another element to this story. <clears throat> and Christ has this theme going on. He compares himself to a, to a rock, uh, to a large stone. A building stone. And remember last week we noted that the largest stones in King Herod's temple weighed over 600 tons. So Jesus said those big, huge stones that are at the base of the temple, that's me. And uh, these were the cornerstones, and you'd build the rest of the building on this, and Jesus is going to claim 
Uh, three things about himself. One, he's the cornerstone of what God is doing next. So the church era, God bringing the church to the world, he said, I'm the cornerstone of that. Secondly, people that are walking proudly with self-assurance, self-confidently, they're going to be tripped up by Jesus Christ. You have to trip over Jesus Christ. And incidentally, that's a good thing, because if you trip over Jesus Christ, you can find your hands and knees. Uh, and we should all be on our knees before holy God. Thirdly, those that don't build their lives upon him will be crushed by him. And this is Jesus, again, saying not the popular thing, not the easy thing. It's a very offensive thing. Jesus saying, basically, you better get right with me, otherwise I will crush you. Uh, please open your Bibles now to Matthew chapter 21. <clears throat> I was uh, praying for a humorous story this week, and it didn't come, so I don't know if you find that humorous. That was my story. So Jesus says in, in verse 33, Listen to another parable. And remember, he's talking to this crowd at the temple. He's talking to the religious elite at the temple. There was a landlord who planted a, a vineyard. He put a wall around it dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized the servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent, another, he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his own son to them. They will respect my son, he said. And again, we, we get a picture of God sending prophets to people. Repent, God's real. You have to get right with God. And people reacting very violently, angrily to that. Uh, sometimes just ignoring, sometimes lashing out, sometimes even killing uh, God's people. And then last of all, Jesus comes, and Jesus is different. He's just not another prophet. <laughs> Uh, we're supposed to have a response. And the proper response to Jesus Christ is respect. Jesus comes, and we're supposed to get right with him. But, and here Jesus is going to prophesy his own death, but when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir, come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. Don't ask me how that works. I don't know how you kill the heir and then you get the inheritance, but I think that's... Uh, Probably the way sin works. Sin doesn't make a lot of sense. Rebellion against God, what am I rebelling against? Everything good, everything wonderful, everything holy. Uh, sin doesn't make sense, but they think they, they've got this brilliant plan. So they took him, and they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Well, he's talking to the religious elite here, and I don't know if they get in the story yet. Because they said, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end. They replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. You have uh, God sends the prophets, and they weren't listening. God sends Jesus Christ. Jesus, God has sent Jesus to our world, to our planet, and, uh, and everybody has to respond to Christ. Are we going to embrace him as cornerstone of our life? Yeah, it's my foundation. I'm going to build my life upon Jesus Christ. Are we going to be walking around in our own self-confidence, like we don't need God, and we trip over God? Wow. Jesus Christ died for me, the cross is there for me. Or are we 
running along, you know, and trip over it and just curse, curse that it was there. I wish there was no Jesus. I wish there was no God. I want to just do my own thing. Or, or, uh, or we can remain in rebellion and keeping God at arm's length. And God has got justice, and the wrath of God will come down on disobedience and rebellion. And we will be crushed by the reality of a holy God. We will be crushed. And uh, we talked about being up on the wrong side of that equation. The doors of heaven are wide open, but not everybody goes. You know why that is? Because a lot of people don't want to be with God. The doors of heaven are wide open, and anybody who would turn and put their faith in Jesus Christ will be forgiven. God's not looking for reasons to keep you out of heaven. God's doing all he can to bring you into a relationship with him. God, uh, the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that he rejoices in the death of his saints. He rejoices when his people die. Why? Because he wants to bring us home. It's like a mom and dad who haven't seen their kid. who have gone off to the military, their college or something. He comes home, they're so happy. God wants to be with his people and is looking forward to the day when all together uh, God doesn't rejoice over the death of the wicked. When we're living a life in rebellion, God, he doesn't take any pleasure in that. But here's the reality. God has given us this amazing responsibility. It's called be will. Sometimes people reject God, and they say, because I want my freedom. But think about that. If, if God's not part of the equation, in what sense are we free? If God's part of the equation... In what sense are we free? Well, I can do whatever I want. Well, what do, what do our choices matter? Well, I could steal or I could not steal. 20 years after you're dead, does it matter? How about 100 years? How about 1,000 years? I could truth or I could come for my own benefit. Does it matter in the future? I mean, ask yourself this. Does it matter whether a Mayan merchant ripped out some other Mayans to you? No. You're free. To, to sleep with who you want to, to, to do to your own body, whatever you want to. You can, you can live your life however you want. It doesn't matter. So you're free to make an infinite number of choices that are all gray. People don't like black and white. I don't see what's so special about gray. I got a, I got, I got a whole, whole selection of choices that don't matter set before me. When God comes in the equation, we have all the beautiful color of life. Yeah, there is right and wrong, and I have this terrible weight of responsibility because here's how much God honors you. Here's how much God has given you. He's given you the ability to choose to be with him for eternity, to turn your back on him. <coughs> and your choice matters, and that's freedom. That's freedom to make a choice that matters. That's, that's the difference between sitting in a, a, a warm room with muddy, muddy thinking and it's too hot and too humid and is stepping out, and their fresh air hits you in the face and say, wait a second, I can walk towards God or I can walk away from God. God's giving me this tremendous responsibility, and yes, I do have freedom, and yes, choices do matter. My choice matters. <coughs> so the whole world is going to trip over Jesus Christ because he said, I'm the Savior of the world. Uh, he's given his life for us so that through faith in him, we can have this relationship with God. And everybody on the planet excuse me, has to decide how they're going to respond. We all have to decide, what am I going to do with Jesus? What am I going to do with Jesus? I'm going to live my life pretending there's no God, even though underneath the surface you've got a lot of music, a lot of TV shows, got work, got bills paid, but under the surface we know there's this spiritual reality. We, we get it instinctually. That's the way we're made. Everybody gets it. And so we try to keep God away, try to ignore him. We try to throw dust in the air and make some excuses for not getting right with him, but in the end, everybody has to deal with the God question, with Jesus Christ, what am I going to do with Jesus? And we would either get right with Jesus and find out that, yeah, it doesn't matter what I've done. Jesus Christ's blood that he shed on the cross can forgive it all. <coughs> Heaven's doors are open and anybody can go in. What matters is the choice. Am I going to accept God's love or am I going to ignore God's love? Am I going to run to Jesus, or I'm going to say, I'm highly tailing it out here. I don't need this God thing, and run the other direction. We can, uh, Jesus says, if you hear my words, put them into action. Don't just say, yeah, I believe Jesus. Check. That's not faith. Yeah, I hear your words, Jesus, and I believe your way is better, and I'm going to live for your way. That's faith. And so we can build our lives on him, or it's stumbling and crushing. 
Those are the options that the rock of Jesus Christ has given us. We build our life on him or it's stumbling and crushing. According to the Bible background commentary, a rabbi once said, this rabbi warned, if a pot falls on a rock, woe to the pot, right? A clay pot. If a pot falls on a rock, woe to the pot. If a rock falls on the pot, woe to the pot. Either way, woe to the pot. <laughs> when we're dealing with God, <laughs> better get right. Better get right with the Lord. Got to get right with Christ. Unbelief and rebelliousness lead us places that uh, don't do us any favors. Think about when we've been in, in, in sin in our life and we've been in, we know we're doing something contrary to the will of God. Brothers and sisters, how'd that work out for you? We all know we're messed up in here, right? It's not just the world's messed up, not just our coworkers are messed up. We're messed up, and we know this. Why make excuses for it any longer? Why try to say, no, God, I'd be perfect if it wasn't for this wife. God, I'd be perfect if you gave me better parents. God, I'd be, oh, come off it. Let's grow up. Let's own up. Let's own our own actions and thoughts and words. And the proper thing to do when God sends his son, when the, when the owner sends his son, is to respect. And say, okay, Jesus, you are good. I want to be more like you. Okay, God, your ways are better than my ways. And I'm going to turn from my ways. I'm going to turn to your ways. Got to get right with Christ. Unbelief doesn't work for us. There's nothing, there's nothing going for us in that. Rebellion, again, would be rebellion against all things good and beautiful and holy and wonderful and noble. Romans <clears throat> chapter 9 puts a different spin on this. The Apostle Paul points out that another way people stumble it's not just rebelliousness. It's just unbelief. Another way people stumble on the stumbling block, which is a cool phrase that Paul uses, stumble on the stumbling block, is trying to earn God's favor by our good deeds. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, there's, the God is good. Heaven's perfect. And by golly, I'm going to polish up and get there myself. Thank you for the cross, Jesus. Thank you for doing I'm sure that meant a lot. You probably did about half the work. I'll do the other half. Or maybe if we're really humble... Jesus, you did 99%, and I'm just glad I can do the other 1%. No. You stumble over Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ, listen, Jesus Christ died because we can't cut it. If you could go to heaven because you're such a good person, why would heaven come down to us? Why would Jesus have come down and paid for our sin on the cross? Why would he have died for us? Okay? We can't add anything. And if we think we're going to be so religious and get to heaven, or we can do so many good deeds we can get to heaven, you have got to trip over Jesus Christ because he's standing in front of the path of your child. You cannot, walk, you cannot walk or ride into heaven with your chest puffed out thinking you're all that. You've got to fall over Jesus Christ, land on your hands and knees and say, Lord, forgive me, I messed up. God, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Amen? I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Lord, if you're not a God of forgiveness, I have hope. But if you're God of forgiveness, I'm going to be okay. People who think they can get to heaven or they can get right with God based out upon the things they can do have got to stumble over the stumbling block, as Paul says. You have to fall over Jesus Christ because that cross would not be there. You could do it on our own. Lastly, the name of our church is Foundation Bible Church. The Bible is the basis of our life. Christ is our foundation. For our church and for our lives, we're not going to just preach easy, comfortable messages. Oh, look at this, Adam. I got your email there. If you can see it on camera, no. <laughs> uh, nobody can see that. Uh, for 20 bucks, I'll let you know what it is. No. <clears throat> this is the foundation of our lives. We build our life here, the Word of God. Because what's in here, I already know that don't work. I already know I can't trust myself. I need to trust something better and higher than me. And ultimately, Jesus Christ, God in flesh, coming down because he loves us, and he loves us enough that he wants us to know him, and he loves us enough he wants us to be with him. That love is the foundation of the universe itself, and everything was made, everything that is, trillions of stars, all made so that God could create a people that would be his people. He would love us, we would love him in return. That this is the foundation of everything. That's the foundation of our faith, and that's where we stand. That's where we plant our flag. This is what I'm about. And God's a God of grace, and I want to be a man.
man of grace. I want grace for myself. I really want grace for other people. God forgives. I want to be a person of forgiveness. God is patient. I want to be a patient person. Now, uh, let's close now by turning to 1 Peter. It's after, after Hebrews, after James. And now look here at a bookmark. Thank you for preaching the Bible from Liddy. Isn't that nice? The Holy Bible. I like that. When I see it, it makes me happy. <laughs> Just for that, I'm going to read Adam's email. No. <laughs> yeah, that's right. First Peter chapter 2. One of those little ones near the end. First Peter chapter 2. And I'm uh, going to read the first 10 verses. Here's God's instruction to the Apostle Peter. God's instruction for the, the Christian church. Are you a Christian? Yes. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Yes. Then this is God's will for you. Therefore, brothers, sisters, rid yourself of all malice. That, that, that just hatred that drives you. Rid yourself of that. And all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Have you tasted that the Lord is good? That just like a newborn baby needs his mother's milk, you should crave, crave the things of God so that you can grow up in your faith. As you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, rejected by human beings but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, as you come to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? So not only is Jesus a stone, we're all stones in the structure of what God is doing. You're part of what God is doing. If you, are, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, now you're part of a stone. You're another brick in the wall of what God is doing on planet Earth. And it's better to be part of what God is doing, since God is good, than to be walking away and going into darkness. For <clears throat> in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. But now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But, those, but to those who don't believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Brothers and sisters, friends, uh, God is good. God has a much better plan for our lives, and it's up to us to respond because God made us to choose. You know, if God forced us to love him, we'd just be robots. Ants can be ants. Cows, have you ever thought about this? When we destroy the environment willfully, we're sinning. But when a cow, a herd of cows, herd of buffalo overgraze, they're not sinning. They just do what cows and buffalo do. We can choose to turn our back on God or to go choose God. He's given us this great weight, this great honor of responsibility. Everyone, let's take this seriously. We've all got to deal with Jesus Christ, this rock of offense, this stumbling block. Am I going to build my life on Jesus Christ? Am I stumble over it? If not, the reality of God is something that's going to crush us. The weight of God, his, his awesomeness, His glory is going to come down upon us and there will be no hope left for us because He's given us this choice, given us an opportunity to respond to Him. Heaven is a real place, so is hell. Hell is eternal separation from a loving God. I don't want to go there. I don't want any of anybody hearing this message today to go there. And everybody can uh, enter into heaven by turning their, to their, learning their lives for Jesus Christ, saying, God, I believe. Thank you for the cross. I see that you are better than mine. I'm done making excuses myself. I'm done defending all my actions. Just forgive me, Lord. I want to live my life for you. And that's how we turn our lives from going one direction to building our lives upon Jesus Christ, the living stone. Amen?
Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.